just sang uh, we just sang behold our god can you tell me the words after that seated on a throne come let us adore him then behold our king nothing can compare come and let us adore him thank you prabhu for thank you prabhu for uh, reading god's word uh, <clears throat> in the last few weeks in the last few weeks we have gone through the holy spirit's inspiration to dr luke and we covered a few major events until the start of jesus ministry here on earth that we learned last week so to quickly recap these are a few things uh so we looked at the birth of john the baptist and the birth of jesus being foretold being told by the angels we looked at we looked at zechariah's and mary's song of praise we looked at the birth of our messiah our savior king jesus and then we saw jesus was presented in a temple in the temple and uh, he, later we saw that he was he stayed behind at the temple and then we looked at john the baptist what did he come to do he came to proclaim a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and then uh, we looked at jesus's baptism by john and then the genealogy and temptation and last week we uh, saw the start of jesus ministry or jesus ministry before we look at uh, this morning's passage uh, shall we just look to the lord again um, let's pray our father your word is truth and i pray father that we will not just have come here to know the truth but we would have come here to believe the truth and father i pray that your word will be the sole focus this morning and i pray for all the distractions and if there is infirmities in my speaking none of that will will come in the way of your word and what your word needs to do thank you for this morning and we commit and commend ourselves to you in jesus name amen, amen. so this morning we are looking from luke chapter 5 verse 27 okay looking great till now okay please open your bibles to luke chapter 5 verse 27 to chapter 6 verse 11 and we will see through this portion three pharisee controversies and we'll see the lord of the sabbath three pharisee controversies and the lord of the sabbath So before we get to chapter 5 we saw in chapter 4 that our lord began his ministry by preaching in the synagogue of galilee and we saw two sabbaths in particular one we were able to see in the synagogue of nazareth and we saw that our lord we saw what had our lord had to say there and how he was so shamefully treated and then we were able to be on the wall of the synagogue in capernaum where jesus apparently received a better reception there but while the reception appeared to be good he later had to tell capernaum that they will be cast into the lowest hell now these people did not believe his claims these people did not forsake their sins and jesus taught now this is important jesus taught that following christ is not a matter of just desire or wanting him following him is a matter of believing who he is his claims and repenting of our sins and then we come to chapter 5 and though we are only going to start from verse 27 if if i have to kind of pick one verse that will cement the entire portion from chapter 5 verse 1 to verse uh, 33 that would be verse 32 and verse 32 says i have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance i have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance so why does jesus say that let's look at that portion so that we understand why jesus says that and we'll read from verse 27 to 33 after this he went out and saw a tax collector named levi 
sitting at the tax booth and he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. To summarize, when Matthew responds to Jesus' call, he throws a feast, he throws a party. And that's how he responded to Jesus calling him to follow him. Now, I want you to think for a moment, isn't that the only right response for a person who has discovered the grace of God in Jesus Christ for that person to rejoice that way. And I also want you to think how much more should there be that kind of rejoicing when we come to worship the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins that he's given us. You know, when you look at Psalm 32 verse 1, and I don't have it on the slide, but I'll read it out. It says, how blessed is the man or how happy is the man whose wrongdoing is forgiven, whose sin is uncovered. Now, Matthew is thinking this. Matthew thinks, he's just called me. He's just saved me. Let's celebrate. And he throws, and he throws a feast. And in this party, he invites all his tax collector friends because he wants them to meet Jesus. And this man doesn't want to go to heaven alone. He wants all his tax collectors and sinners who are his buddies to be there and to meet the Lord Jesus. Because according to Matthew, this man is worth giving up everything for. Now there are another set of people over there. And they are called the Pharisees. And they don't like the fact that Jesus is associating with tax collectors and sinners. And so what do they do? They attack his disciples and they say, what are you guys doing hanging around with sinners? And even before they could open their mouth, Jesus answers the Pharisees. And he says, you know, doctors aren't here to heal the healthy. They are here to heal the sick. And in the same way, I haven't come for the righteous. I have come for the, for the sinners. Now, of course, there's an irony in this. On one hand, you see, this appeals to the Pharisees because the Pharisees think of themselves as righteous and they think of themselves as healthy people. But it's almost as Jesus is saying, look, you guys don't need what I have. It's these sinners out here who need what I have to offer. But that's exactly the irony. It's not that the Pharisees don't need what Jesus has to offer. It's that they don't think they need what Jesus has to offer. Dear church, every one of us in this room is sitting either where the tax collectors are or we are sitting where the Pharisees are. If you don't think you're a sinner, if you don't think that you need grace, you're sitting in that Pharisee's chair. And, if you're in, and on the other hand, if you're a sinner, and if you think that your sin is just one step beyond the reach of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, here's what Jesus is saying to you. He's saying, I have come to call sinners, all kinds of sinners. That's what I came for. And don't think I can't do what I came for. Every one of us is sitting in one of those two chairs. Let me also ask you this. Are you that person who has admitted to believe with your lips, but you don't really believe it with your heart and with your life? Do you, deep down, not outwardly, but deep down, do you believe that you are a good person? And if you do, you are sitting with the Pharisees today. And until God opens your eyes to what you are and what you need, you're going to continue to sit with the Pharisees today. There are no righteous people and there are no healthy people without Christ. And Paul, quoting the Old Testament, he says, there is no one righteous 
no not one so when jesus says he's come for sinners and not for the healthy it's not because there are some people out there who are healthy and righteous without christ it's just that there are some people out there who think that they are and notice what jesus does he calls those sinners to repentance he does not say to the sinners you know you're really okay i mean you're not the best but you're okay he doesn't say that he comes to sinners and he says repent and follow me if that's where you're sitting today hear that call because it is jesus's call it's not my call it's not even the church calling out but it is jesus who's calling and saying that i have come to call sinners to repentance and then our great pharisees have another question why don't your disciples fast let's look at that passage oh yeah was 33 to 35 and they said to him the disciples of john fast often and offer prayers and so do the disciples of the pharisees but yours eat and drink and jesus said to them can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast in those days so the pharisees say see john's disciples fast and i we know that you like him our disciples fast and you don't like them but tell me this why don't you fast isn't that the right thing for holy people to do and jesus answer here is amazing jesus answer is ultimately all about who he is jesus answer is look you don't invite people to a feast and ask them to fast at a wedding you feast and jesus says look i am the bridegroom i am the center of the universe and as long as i am around we will feast when i'm gone my disciples will fast but right now the bridegroom is here now do you understand what jesus is saying jesus is saying that i am the one that brings this world joy and as long as i am around my disciples are going to rejoice they are going to feast not fast and we see this example while connecting this with what matthew did because when he was saved what did he do he threw a feast but they and and didn't fast let's look at the next yeah let's look at the next part uh verse 30 verse 36 to 39 and he told them a parable no one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment if he does he will tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old and no one puts new wine into old wine skins if he does the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed but new wine must be put into fresh wine skins and no one after drinking old wine desires new for he says the old is good so he's telling them a story he says you know nobody takes a new piece of cloth and patches up an old garment with that new piece of cloth because it it won't match and nobody takes new wine and pours it into an old wine skin that's already been old that's been rigid that's been dried out because it will burst and he says you know that is the problem with you pharisees you try and come in bringing all your legalistic tendencies and rituals and look at stitching on a little bit of jesus but when you do that it won't work and church i want to tell us this that the the reason some of us when jesus says this we are also in a dilemma is because many a times we are also a, we are also literally a walking contradiction and what what i mean by that is we need we know that we need christ and we know that coming to christ demands complete transformation but it is at that point that we want to get off the train and we no longer want to be with jesus jesus tells the pharisees that i have come to call sinners men and women and boys and girls from every tribe tongue people and nation to god through me the ceremonial law is not coming back again 
the things that you care about and which you have invested your righteousness have gone away. Ceremonial righteousness is gone and guess what's coming? Real righteousness has come in. And yet, you're going to prefer the old wine. You're going to say, you know, Jesus, I, I don't like what you're bringing. I like what I'm already doing. But Jesus says, I'm not coming to do what you think I'm here to do. Because your view of what the Messiah is going to do is too small and it is too narrow. You're satisfied with the righteousness you have. You're satisfied with the kingdom that was. I come to bring a righteousness that you don't have and to build a kingdom that has not been built yet. And you are not going to like it. Church, when we look back and we, you know, we can nod our heads at the Pharisees and talk about, you know, what kind of legalists they were. Like, so bad people, right? You know, the definition of legalism, and this is not from, uh, you know, this is just something that from inference I made up. So if you, you won't see this in the Oxford Dictionary. But legalism is following a rule or a law in the assumption that it will lead us to righteousness, to freedom and salvation. So whether we are legalists or the other spectrum or the other end of the spectrum where we are, legal, where we are spiritually unconcerned people, If we are not trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, if we don't see that we are sinners totally hopeless and helpless in need of his grace, then we are still sitting where the Pharisees were. And we are saying we like it the way it used to be. We like coming on Sunday morning, saying hi, how are you? And then going back and then having a super meal and then some gossip, having a good nap. You know, we like that. If you're sitting in either of those seats, legalistic or spiritually unconcerned people, we are sitting exactly where the Pharisees are sitting and we are saying, Jesus, we don't need what you're bringing. We are good enough on our own and we don't need Jesus. And that is the issue that is set before us today. Because the only people that will be in his kingdom that Jesus is bringing are people who know that they are sinners and who know that they need the unmerited favor of God every single day. And there will be no sinner in that kingdom who having received the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will think, you know what, his grace is not sufficient for me. Uh, you know, I mean, his grace is good, but it's not enough for me. Because just like Matthew, when you truly encounter this Jesus, you realize that he's worth giving up everything and he has a power to do and to save beyond what you have ever imagined. And with that, we come to chapter 6. And this is the passage which one of the, where we see one of the familiar encounters between Jesus and the Pharisees. Now, before we go into chapter 6, into reading chapter 6, I want to give you a context because it's about the Sabbath. I want to give you a context of why, what was the Sabbath in the Old Testament? Why did God give the Sabbath? And so it's going to be a crisp history lesson, but just to remind us on what was the Sabbath and what had become of the Sabbath. So the Sabbath command was a distinctive mark and a sign to Israel. In Exodus, God told the children of Israel that the Sabbath was one thing that was going to set them apart from the nations. It had been given to them in the Ten Commandments as a blessing. Now you remember the children of Israel were a nation of slaves. And that meant that they had lived in forced labor every single day. They lived in labor for in forced labor in Egypt for over 400 years years. And so for four centuries, their time had belonged to their masters. And at Mount Sinai, God said to them, you may not work one day out of every seven days. And you can see immediately the blessing that that would have been to the nation of slaves who were forced to work every single day to have a day of rest in between. 
And this day also meant to be a day of worship and it set them apart from the nations around them. And when their neighbors saw that pausing on the last day of every week to worship God, it set them apart as those who worshipped the Lord, the God of Israel, the one who had given the Sabbath day to them. Now the story of Israel doesn't end there. You know the story of Israel. The Israel didn't do a good job of keeping the Sabbath. In fact, they didn't even do a good job of worshipping the Lord God. Israel went after other gods. Israel didn't keep the Sabbath day. And we see Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and other prophets are filled with stories of their failure, of Israel's failure to keep the Sabbath that the Lord had given them. So Jeremiah tells them that God sent the children of Israel into exile in the year 586 for 70 years because of their failure to keep the Sabbath. And when the children of Israel came back out of that captivity, they were determined that they were not going to break the Sabbath command again. And so what happened? And so the rabbis, their scribes and their lay, lay leaders began to build laws around, around God's law to protect them from breaking that command. In fact, by the time Jesus comes into this world, an entire book of rabbinic teaching on what they were not to do on the Sabbath day was built and the Pharisees were very, very picky about what you could do and you couldn't do on the Sabbath. In fact, one of the scribes, and this is what we're going to see why they had a big problem, one of the scribes taught that if you reap, thresh, and prepare grain in a larger amount, that which you could keep in a dried fig, you had broken the Sabbath. Now bear that in mind in the story that we are about to read, because they were very, the Pharisees were very, very particular about the observance of Sabbath. And that sets the stage for this conflict that we see between Jesus and his disciples and the Pharisees. Now, to summarize chapter 6, verse 1 to 11, Luke, in recounting this hostile encounter between Jesus and the Pharisees, is pointing us to something significant, very significant, about our hearts and about the Lord's day. Let's read this passage and we will look at three main things from this uh, passage uh, as a whole. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, have you not read what, G what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to the, those with him. And he said to them, The Lord, sorry, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And on another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts and he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to them, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. And they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what, might, what they might do to Jesus. The first thing I want you to look out for, for in this passage is simply this. Jesus' message to the Pharisees is not that they have made a slight overreaction or an overcorrection in their interpretation of the Sabbath. His message to them is that they have entirely missed the point of the Sabbath. So please look out for that in the message. The second thing I want you to see is the example that Jesus gives of what he does on the Sabbath day. Because I believe that Jesus' example of how he kept the Sabbath day gives us a wonderful guide for how we ought to observe the Sabbath or the Lord's Day. And then third, I want you to ask the question, in this passage, who is the Lord of the Sabbath? 
because that church is really the fundamental question of all. And if you and I get that one right, almost everything else works itself out from there. So be on the lookout for the points that I mentioned. One, what is the point that Jesus says the Pharisees are missing? Second, the example Jesus gives of observing the Sabbath. And then, who is the Lord of the Sabbath? Over 150 years ago, there was this theologian called uh, J.C. Ryle, and he said our Sundays and how we use them is one of the most sure signs of our spiritual condition. Our Sundays and how we use them is one of the most sure signs of our spiritual condition. How do we use our Sunday? What is at the heart of our Lord's Day? Luke is telling us something that not only reveals something to us about the hearts of the Pharisees and what was the heart of their experience, what, what was at the heart of their experience of the Sabbath, but it forces us to look at our own hearts and ask how we use the Lord's Day. I want you to look at three things. First of all, let's see what Jesus says is the fundamental problem with the Pharisees' approach to the Sabbath day. So there are two stories here, right? One where Jesus' disciples are hungry. So what's happening? They're ministering on the Lord's day. They're walking through the grain field. And as they walk through that grain field, the disciples just pick the heads of the grain and they eat. Now, they are not. this is not stealing. And this was specifically allowed by the law. You were allowed to pick the excess of grain in a field if you were hungry and if you were poor, if you're a poor person who was walking by that way. So the Pharisee, Pharisees, interestingly, don't accuse the disciples of stealing. But what the Pharisees do accuse them of doing is breaking the Sabbath by picking that grain and rubbing it together and then preparing it and eating it. And the Pharisees said they were breaking the Sabbath law. Now, we need to know very quickly that there was no such law as that found in Moses' law. This is their interpretation of how Moses' law is to be applied in this particular situation according to the teachings of the rabbi. And so what you have over here immediately is you have the Pharisees' interpretation of God's word over Jesus' interpretation of God's word. I'll repeat that. You have the Pharisees' interpretation of God's word set over Jesus' interpretation of God's word. And you have the Pharisees accusing the disciples of the Lord Jesus being Sabbath breakers and the Lord Jesus being Sabbath breakers. And then there is the second story, which starts from uh, verse 6. And here Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. Now, the Pharisees have a law about that. Pharisees have a law about that too. The Pharisees said it is okay to heal someone if they were in danger of dying on the Sabbath. But if they were not in danger of dying on the Sabbath, you couldn't heal them. Now, again, there is no passage like this in the Old Testament. This is based on the interpretations, the traditions of the Pharisees and the rabbis and the scribes and not on the word of God. So you have two cases in which Jesus and his disciples are brought under the charges of the Pharisees as those who are violating the Sabbath. And in both cases, Jesus responds in such a way to indicate to them that the problem that the Pharisees had was not a misinterpretation of the scripture. It was much deeper than that. Their misinterpretation of scripture was based fundamentally on the fact that they had missed the whole point of the Lord's day. They missed the whole point of God giving the Sabbath to Israel. Now, if I can take you to Genesis for a moment. In Genesis, you remember that when God rested on the, you, you remember that God rested on the seventh day. And he rested on the seventh day, not because he needed to rest, but because we needed to rest. So the Sabbath was intended to be a blessing to God's people. You know, Jesus in Mark 2 indeed says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the, for the Sabbath. And in other words, Jesus is saying the reason that God invented the Sabbath day in the first place was for a blessing to us. Church, he is 
infinite. He doesn't need to rest. We are finite. We need to rest. And therefore, he provided for an even mandated rest so that we could neither deprive ourselves or others of the rest that we need. It's a blessing of God. But the Pharisees had turned that blessing into a burden because they had missed the fundamental point of what the Sabbath was about. Now, in an agricultural society, pausing from your work one day out of seven days was a way of showing two or three things very loud and clear. One thing that it did, one thing that it did was it declared who your allegiance was to. Let me explain that. If you are in an agricultural society and you your working is directly determinative of your eating and you stop working, then whoever you stop working for must be pretty important. And so it sends the message that we serve God and we and he told us to stop working. Secondly, it te- it lets us and people around them know that who your trust is on. So if you are in an agricultural society where your working is directly connected to your eating and you stop working, what does that mean? You got to trust God to provide you. You got to trust the Lord to provide you on that day. I want to remind you of the Israelites depending on the manna that was given to them on the sixth day to be enough for them on the seventh. The seventh day, did not, they did not receive it. But the sixth day had enough for them to be nourished on the seventh day. Now, thirdly, what the Sabbath does is, is it, al- it allows you to declare God in more important ways sorry it allows us to be it allows us to declare god is more important than any blessing we enjoy on this earth even food god is more important than anything else so it's a way of declaring your allegiance to god it's a way of showing who you trust and it's a way of showing your utter dependence on god and of your recognition that god is more important than anything else and the Pharisees had missed the fundamental point of that Sabbath day and they turned the blessing into a burden. I want to ask you this question. Do you and I turn the Lord's day from being a blessing into a burden for us? Moving on, think of the disciples. Now here are the Jesus disciples and what are they doing on the Sabbath day? They're traveling from town to town, preaching the gospel, teaching God's word, turning people back to God, ministering to the poor and to the needy. And Jesus is doing works of healing and the Pharisees are upset because they had eaten a little something. Now this even is not an elaborate meal that they all sat down to. They had passed through the grain field and they picked some of the heads and ate it. And honestly, it wouldn't have been tasty. But the Pharisees don't care about the ministry that Jesus and the disciples are doing. They only care that they they have violated some traditional interpretation of theirs about how we are supposed to keep the Sabbath. Now, there's even a more shocking scene in part 2, which is from verse 6 to 11. Jesus is in the synagogue teaching and there's a man with a withered hand. And Jesus is going to heal this man and the Pharisees know that he's going to heal this man. And so the Pharisees are concerned about what? For that poor man who'd gone through the life with a withered hand? No. They want to catch Jesus in a sin. Now tell me this church, whose heart is right in this circumstance? These people are more concerned about trying to find Jesus in a violation of the law of Moses than they are in seeing a man restored to health. And, you know, you would want to ask them, so it's not okay for Jesus to heal on the Sabbath, but it is okay for you to plot how to kill him on the Sabbath. And, you know, that's exactly what Jesus tells them. He says, look at what he says. He says, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath Sabbath, to do good or to do harm. Now you see, Pharisees' problem was not 
just a tiny overcorrection or overreaction in their interpretation of scripture their problem was that they, they had missed the point they had missed the whole point now church we don't need to be a legalist to miss the whole point of the sabbath day you could be using you and i could be using your christian freedom and our christian freedom and miss the whole point of the lord's day so don't think this is just a problem of the pharisees it's a problem for all of us we can miss the point if our hearts aren't right because you can't you and i can't worship the lord unless our heart is set on the right thing and the problem began with the pharisees not just with their interpretation or misinterpretation but within their hearts being in the wrong place the sabbath was turned from a blessing to a burden and it became a tool not for glorifying god but for them a tool whereby they wanted to trap and destroy a man they missed the whole point of the sabbath and jesus makes that very clear now this is precisely the character of the hypocrite it is a bad symptom of any any of our state of soul or spiritual blindness when any of us begins to put the second things of our faith in the first place and the first things of our faith in the second place let us beware of falling into this state of mind there is something sadly wrong in our spiritual condition when the only thing we look at in ourselves and in others is outward christianity and the activities that we do and when the principal question we should the principal question we ask is whether they worship in our denomination do they do the ceremonies like we do it do they serve god like we do it the question to ask are some of these do they repent of sin do they believe their lives on jesus are they faithfully being discipled and living holy lives set apart for him these are the chief points to which our attention ought to be directed to the moment we begin to place anything in our religion in our faith before these things we are in danger of becoming as thorough pharisees as the accusers of the disciples and jesus another beautiful thing to observe here is how graciously our lord jesus christ pleaded the cause of his disciples and defended them against their accusers you know look at verse 30 uh of chapter 5 okay just going back for a moment and the pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners and verse 31 says and jesus answered them so the question the accusation was for the disciples and who answers jesus answers them we need to remember brothers and sisters that jesus does the same for us This is such an encouraging illustration of how graciously our Lord Jesus Christ is ever doing on behalf of his people. And so let us daily rest our souls on remembering our great friend and advocate in heaven. Let us thank God that believers have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous who's ever maintaining the cause of his people in heaven and continually making intercession. for them secondly i want you to see jesus example of keeping the sabbath in this passage jesus does three things in this passage that are great examples for us on how to keep the lord's day the first thing you will see is you know is in verse 6 uh, of chapter 6 it says it starts with on another sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching this was jesus normal pattern on the sabbath day where is jesus he is in corporate worship with the people of god and that's where we ought to be every lord's day in corporate worship with the people of god and when we are doing that we are just following jesus example given to us secondly jesus makes it clear that the sabbath day is a day when it is lawful to do things that need to be done things that are necessary deeds of necessity so if you look at 
verse 1 of chapter 6, and I read it a few times, but just to uh, remind you again, on the Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their heads. They needed to eat. They were out traveling, doing the work of the Lord, and the only way that they could get the food they needed was to do what they did. And it was an act of necessity, and it was perfectly appropriate according to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Sabbath day is a day of rest, but it's also, Jesus makes it very clear, a day of worship and a day in which you do, you and I do deeds of necessity, deeds that are necessary to be done. And it is also, however, a day in which we do deeds of mercy. And you see this in verse 10 of chapter 6. Jesus is in the synagogue teaching and there's a man with a withered hand and he calls the man up and he heals the man. It's an act of mercy. If God has shown us mercy and if we worship God, how do we worship God best? When we act like he does. So is it appropriate to do deeds of mercy on his day? Yes. And Jesus makes it very clear. And so this is how Jesus used the Lord's day. Worship, deeds of deeds that were important and necessary to be done, deeds of mercy. And he provides us an example of how we can use our Lord's day. I quoted J.C. Ryle earlier and I'll quote him again. He says, it is only a, a few steps down from no Sabbath to no God. And this no is not K-N-O-W, this is N-O. It is only a few steps down from no Sabbath to no God. In other words, our use of the Lord's day is an index of our spiritual health. If our Lord's day is caught up with worship and deeds of necessity and mercy and rest, or is it caught up with something else? Jesus' example is instructive to us. And there's this one last thing that I want you to see here. And it's important. It's, it's the most important thing. It is who is the Lord of the Sabbath. Because in verse 5, you see the rest of the story. Chapter 6, verse 5, you see the rest of the story in the first incident. Jesus, first, Jesus had said, do you remember the story of David? Then he goes on to explain what David did, uh, how uh, David had uh, taken the... Uh, bread that was that was for only for the feast to uh, priest to take, and then he said in verse five, "The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath." For Jesus to say, "I am the Lord of the Sabbath," you understand what he's saying. Jesus is saying, "I created the Sabbath. The Sabbath is my day. The Sabbath is about me. I am the boss of the Sabbath. I am the master of the Sabbath. I am the Lord of the Sabbath." What I say goes on the Sabbath and what I say doesn't go on the Sabbath and you see that is the fundamental question for us today who is the Lord of the Lord's day makes all the difference as to whether you and I are actually keeping the Lord's day if the Lord of your Lord's day is the Lord Jesus Christ then it is a glorious day for all of us but if the Lord of the Lord's day is you and I or someone or something else, then it will be a struggle. It will be a checklist and we have missed the point, the whole point. So that's the real key for our Lord's Day. You and I want to enjoy the Lord's Day. The only way to enjoy the Lord's Day is to enjoy the Lord of the Lord's Day. And that's the whole key to enjoying the Lord's Day. If we don't enjoy the Lord of the Lord's day, if we don't enjoy our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ on the Lord's day, the Sunday, the Lord's day, is going to be miserable for you. If you want to be somewhere else, or if your, if your heart and mind is somewhere else, you're not going to enjoy the Lord's day. You're just going to wait until it's over so that you can get off to doing what you really want to do. So it's really easy for us to look back at those Pharisees and say, you picky Pharisees, hypocrites. But church, our hearts can be just as wrong about the Lord's day as theirs. 
if we don't worship the lord of the lord's day and enjoy him more than we enjoy the pursuit of our own agendas and our own pleasures you know john piper says god is most glorified in us when we are more satisfied in him so four points i want to leave you with um and if you remember the other points that's great but four main points that i want to leave you with <clears throat> following christ is not a matter of wanting him just a mere desire for him but following christ is a matter of believing who he is believing it acting upon that belief his claims and repenting of our sins jesus says i have come to call sinners to repentance do you see your need for this unmerited favor from him daily or are you that person who has admitted with your lips but you don't really believe jesus with your heart and with all your life what is at the heart of your lord's day is it a blessing or is it a burden to you the lord's day will always be a burden if our hearts aren't in the right place so let's follow the example of jesus set before us to observe the lord's day and fourth who is the lord of your sabbath may god bless this bless his words to our hearts on this lord's day and every day as we rely on him and take our rest in him may god's name be glorified shall we just look to the lord in prayer our father we we like to think that we are not like pharisees we like to think that that we are really close to you but father examine our hearts and see if there is any wicked thing in us and restore us to be more like you every single day i pray that our hearts and minds will worship this lord of our sabbath the one who saved us who forgave us and who seated us in this feast that we enjoy together once your enemy now seated at your table this is our story and i pray that you will be the lord of our sabbath and this we ask in the name of your son and pray in jesus name amen mm-hmm.